Um, I'm excited to talk about today's training, especially as it focuses on people who are, you know, looking to make that first hundred thousand, first couple of hundred thousand in the federal space, and maybe you're struggling a little bit. I'm going to give you a complete roadmap. So I'm excited. I like doing training like that. And um, one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we go through today's training is it's not just about 100,000, right? I use that number as a conservative number, but your number could be higher, right? It could be somewhere in there. But it really, today's training is really coming down on small businesses who are getting started and you're trying to figure out, hey, I've been in this a little bit or I'm just getting in and I'm not making money. I want to talk specifically to that. And I don't want to talk conceptually. I want to go tactically to that 100,000 because we can help you make 100,000. You can make a million or a billion on your own. Right. It's a process. And when you learn the process, you're off to the races. So um, one of the things I just wanted to reinforce before I get started with today's training is why I teach small businesses out there, why this is so important uh, for me or to me to be able to help you succeed in what you're doing. And it really comes back to when I sold my last company in, in 2017 and in 2018, I got started with the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. I, I formed it. I was going after uh, things out in Oklahoma. But one of the things I did, I didn't just start an organization. I began to get this education about small businesses across America. I've had multiple small businesses myself, but I never really understood the impact, right? I was so busy heads down trying to build companies um, that I really didn't understand the impact. And I've heard this line before about the small businesses are the backbone of America, which I like, right? I, I, we're the strength of America. Um, but I like to change it and say, we're not just the backbone of America. We are America. You are America. And, and I say that very strongly against larges, right? Large businesses, a lot of that money flows into the shareholders, which are in different countries. Money is spent all around the world. But small businesses spend that money locally uh, just to really put it in perspective, right? Uh, especially with Oklahoma, because I'm out here in D.C. area. And in Oklahoma, um, back in 2018, there was this teacher strike. And I began to understand what was going on. They were making no money. I mean, horrible pay. And part of the reason they couldn't get more money, I mean, some of it is politics, but some of it was just that they didn't have a lot of money uh, in the state. And the teachers get paid by sales tax and other things that are out there, right? I know there's a bunch of other ways. But the idea of when I started looking at, at that is if I can bring in a million dollars into Oklahoma through your business, for example, if I can help small businesses bring in a million dollars, then those small businesses hire what we call primary sector jobs, right? So you hire people to fill those uh, contract roles that you just got. These are primary sector jobs. That money is being spent locally. And then those people turn around and take that paycheck and pay locally for the services in town. And so that's this idea of money recirculating around your community. This is why I say that back, uh, small businesses are not just the backbone, but you are America out there. Um, you're actually building your community and your state in America through the dollars you're bringing in. And so if I can help you succeed, if I can help your company succeed in winning uh, government contracts, then you bring it back to your locality. And I don't care if it's in California or Oklahoma, Mississippi, here in Maryland, where I'm at. Um, if I can bring it back to local communities, we begin to strengthen it. And so that drives me and it drives my team on the chamber. And we're really excited about it. So if you haven't got traction yet going down this you know, GovCon contractor journey in the federal market, um, I want you to understand that it doesn't have to take forever. I understand that sometimes it can feel that way, but it doesn't have to. And I'm going to give you training today that'll hopefully open your eyes to saying, oh, let me do these 10 steps that I'm going to end up teaching you today. So I'm going to cover down on a couple of objectives in today's training. I want to start first with just helping you understand how you see the out year. Right. If you're here today, you're thinking that uh, this is value for you of how do I learn how to make my first hundred K. Right. But I also want you to be looking out to your first million and your first hundred million. Just this idea of looking out. So I'm going to talk about a five year revenue roadmap just so you can see the big picture and then come back to the small picture. The next one is I want to talk about where the money comes from in the federal market from a revenue standpoint. So I described three revenue streams in the federal market. And we're going to I'm going to make sure that you understand those. And then I want to uh, begin to really get into the meat of how to go get that, you know, that revenue that you want. And so in number three, I'm going to be talking about just niching down. You may have heard them. Uh, a lot of us say the niches is in the riches. And the idea is if you focus down, then you're going to be able to make a lot of revenue. But if you're scattered and you, you are unfocused, then you're not going to be rich. You're not going to be making the riches. You're not going to be bringing revenue in because you're not going to know what you're doing. But if you can tighten it down, you're going to really knock it out of the park. And then the last one is I'm going to give you 10 steps on how to reach uh, that first 100,000, right? And you can take these 10 steps, by the way, and turn it into a million dollars because it's a process. 
It is not a one and done. I do not teach secrets. I don't even really teach proprietary stuff. It's like, oh, it's Neil's way. No, I've been in this 20 plus years. There's best practices. And the problem is those best practices sometimes are elusive. I'm just trying to get better and better and better at putting them in front of you so that you can execute on them. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the CupCon Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to my federal sales training, where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner, and since 2018, I've been helping businesses like yours understand that government contracting is not a secret, it's a process. When you follow a process, it goes from A to Z. And when you do that, it leads to repeatable, predictable results. This is what I want for you, is for you to be able to look out and predict your success all right, so clearly you can tell that I move at a fire hose pace because I have a lot of information that usually should be in four to eight hours of content, and I shove it into 30-minute trainings um, so that you can get this training every single day. By the way, before I get too much farther, for our Marines out there, Semper Fi, I just want to say happy birthday to the Marine Corps. Uh, today is the Marine Corps' birthday. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. Um, <laughs> you, see, you see me. I got an opinion about certain things. All right, so let's talk about your revenue goals, right? I just wanted to lay out from a very high level, a five-year roadmap, how you can look out at your revenue. Um, what I have here is not unrealistic, and I'll talk about it in a minute. If you do the right things and enough of the right things the right way, you can hit the goals you lay out. So an example is um, right here, I laid out five years, right, on the left-hand column. Um, and then th there's two colored columns you see, I mean, I'm separating them out by one factor. Uh, right here where it says FTE $50 an hour, right? I'm saying that that's your average hourly rate for your company. And the reason this is important is because if you take your hourly rate and multiply it by two, that equals your um, annual revenue, right? Just do it on a calculator someday. It's fun. Um, so year one, what I'm saying is if you have one person billing out at $50 an hour, you're going to bring in $100,000. That's today's training, right? And again, you can expand that. My companies, even back in 98, I've never charged less than $100 an hour. Um, and so for me, I put that over here. For those of us who are in the IT world, uh, we certainly are in the $100, $100 an hour range or should be. Um, and so if you look at $100 an hour, that one FTE is worth $200,000. This is what I meant by today's training when I say how to make your first $100,000. That's a very conservative number. Um, you can actually make more as you go forward. One of my assumptions is that uh, for many of you, you might actually be the one doing the billable work, which is fine in the beginning. Okay, so um, I just wanted to walk through just really quickly because uh, I want to save a lot of my time for the end. But when you think about the revenue, if you start off in the next 12 months ago, I want to make 100,000, right? Or whatever number is, you put your minimum number, that's the start for you. Um, I want to make 100,000. Well, year two, it is not unrealistic for you to be able to have five people working for your company, maybe you included, bringing in 500,000. So that's a huge jump forward percentage wise, but it's only five people, right? And, and when you learn about relationships and building relationships out there with other companies, what if you had relationships with four companies who liked what you did and invited you into their opportunities? It's not gonna be hard to get one opportunity in a year with four different companies. That's the kind of process you need to track. It's, it's not like you're magically gonna be handed this. It's not like you're gonna write a proposal or something and get it. And so the same progress as you go forward, right? I just wanted you to see, you can go for 100,000 to 500,000 to 2 million to four to eight, right? You can figure out what the staggering in, but what I have here is not unrealistic. It's not unrealistic for you to get to 80 people in five years if you follow a process, if you follow what I'm saying today, and if you follow generally what I teach in training, but if you focus, on an agency, if you focus on a, a core competency and you follow a process, of course you can build a company in that direction. You know, if you've got that core competency, that's totally doable. The government spends the money. They're looking for businesses that are qualified, procurement ready to work with, right? So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to confuse you to think that you can just get a handout from here. But if you put the hard work in, you're going to get it. And I'll talk about what the hard work is in a second. And you can see the same thing, right? If I started a new company tomorrow and all I did was that business, I would set my goal for 20 million in five years. I'm gonna build a $20 million company in five years. Uh, that's totally doable. I have companies that do it left and right, right? Those are the ones I wanna actually start bringing out in 2024 to show you. It's like, hey, here's how I built it. Okay, so that was uh, just a quick way of looking at the, the dollars, right? It's not just 100,000 I'm talking about. I'm saying 100,000 is the start to your future. Uh, whatever direction that is, right? 
So the next thing I wanted to make sure you understood is that there's three ways to make money in the federal government. If you think about the federal government has a big pot of money and that's what they spend with contractors, there's three ways to access that money. You can subcontract under small businesses because there are small business set-asides. So that pool of money is different, right? You can access money that way. And that means you're, you're, when you subcontract under a small business, it's not you who has a contract with the government. Somebody else does and you're subcontracting. You're working under them. You might think corp to corp, things like that, right? But when you, when you do it in the government contracting world, we call it subcontracting, but it literally is corp to corp, right? Um, so this idea of subcontracting under small is one revenue stream. The second revenue stream is when you go directly to an agency and you get a contract with them. They award you a contract. You might even have companies working under you, but you're the prime contractor. That's the second revenue stream. And the third revenue stream is subcontracting under large businesses. And this is another set of money, right? They are out there. They're winning large contracts and they have small business plans in place to work with small businesses like yours and mine or something, right? And so working with them, that's a third revenue stream. When companies are mature enough, I say that you should be getting money from all three all you know every year. You should never stop once you get to all three. But right now, if you're in this training and you're looking at how do I make $100,000, right? Getting my first 100,000, that's the title of today's training, then I want you to only look at subcontracting under small businesses. These people remember what it was like to be you. These people remember what it was like to be small. These people struggle to hire people. If you can come in and fill a need, they're going to be happy to work with you. And you instantly are talking to owners or senior, senior leaders uh, in there who are just going to have a conversation about how can we work together, right? Givers gain. Um, small businesses are really focused on that. And so I want you to stay completely away from priming with agencies and subbing under larges or even knocking on either one of their doors for like two or three years. Make two or three million before you start knocking on those doors. If you're in the service-based business, there's no reason for you to do those other two. You can make a lot of money subcontracting under small while that small business is doing most of the hard administration of a contract and you're in there doing the work. You're getting money so you can hire more people. You're getting experience in the government space. You're learning how to write better and better proposals as a part of a proposal team. You're getting clearances into an agency. You're maybe building up your certifications. You're doing all these things, subbing under small, that will then enable you to go into an agency. So I have a whole separate training on those three revenue streams just on 30 minutes, just on those three. So you can go watch that. Um, so let's move on into the this whole idea of the riches is in the niches, right? Um, and the whole point of that is to saying, if you can focus down, then you can begin to achieve success. And so right here, what I want to share is a couple of reasons on why it's vital to sell only one thing. I really want you to understand that. But before I tell you those reasons on why it's vital, and you can be reading it already on the screen, I just wanted to make sure you understood what I mean by niching down and, and, and really niching down to the lowest possible level you can that is of value to somebody. So uh, first thing I, I suggest to you, if you haven't done this already, is really think about what are we good at? What are we great at? Like the best of the best. What could I go get a job doing if I'm, you know, if you're the billable person right now, if you're a subject matter expert who has started a company, et cetera, what are we good at? What do we know? Do we have any uh, small experience in the commercial side or state and local or something? Or did I just come from a job and start a company? Those kind of things. Think about it, but pick one and go, this is what we're really good at. I put a couple of examples here to what it means by niching down. So um, project management. That's not niched enough for me if you're trying to make your first 100,000, right? It's good if you, as you're getting bigger. But right now, when you say project management, that is so big. There's project management theory and strategy. There's whole earn value management, um, you know, understanding the whole calculation of the cost of a project. There's execution on the project. But one of the things I put here is there's project scheduling. Uh, my wife worked at one of the IC uh, agencies, and, and this was, you know, a decade ago now, but uh, when she was working there, she was making high six figures scheduling. She was managing major projects between uh, CIA, NSA, D DNI, all these agencies all coming together on some major initiative, right? And her big project, she was a PMP and so experienced project manager, but they covered down and said, we need you scheduling, managing all this activity. Well, you could do that same thing. If you're a project manager, what are you good at? You know, are you really maybe good at business anal analysis, things like that? Um, the second one I put in is construction, right? If you're in the construction services area, 
narrow down, right? Uh, coming down to elevators and say, we don't do all construction, we do flooring or we do painting, right? We do framing or plumbing, picking one niche. And the important thing of this exercise is that you got to fight FOMO, fear of missing out. The reason we don't niche down, the reason you might not niche down is because you're afraid that if you say, I only do elevators or I only do scheduling, then people are gonna go, oh, I'm not gonna give you any business. It actually is the complete opposite. If you, if you begin to reach out and try to build relationships with people out there that your company can work with, and you say, hey, we're project management focused on scheduling. That's our world. We're the best in scheduling, right? If you talk about that, when you get in, it'll be really easy for people to identify where you're at, right? This is where I'm going into the value of the niche. It makes it easy for everyone to help you and to understand where you can fit into their world, right? So, oh my God, this is perfect. And then once you're in, you can grow it. That's called organic sales growth, right? Organic sales is this ability to grow the existing customers that you have, the existing relationships. But when you're just getting started out there, if you say you do too many things, it's too hard. Or if you're a very small business who says, oh, we do program and project management. Well, really, that's what Booz Allen does. <laughs> I, I think I'm going with Booz Allen, the billion dollar firm, right? And so you got to find that niche down there. The second thing is, a value of niching down is as you start growing, you know, and maybe you're a billable person that gets out there and does the work, it makes it easy to hire and to backfill you as your company grows. So if you get into one place and you're doing some work, you can sit there and say, hey, I'd love to backfill this position and help you on the next one, right? And then you kind of work yourself around until you're getting five or 10 people and now you no longer have to be billable. And, and um, but when you have a niche, it's really easy for you to hire because you know these people, you only have to worry about asking the same questions over and over to candidates and, and understanding where they might fit with your customers. You can build relationships with a lot of people in this common area. The, the next one on the value of niching, right, is you can partner with OEMs. Uh, these are companies out there that are trying to sell to the government as an example, or they're selling products in, but they really don't have any relationships in there. They don't have relationships with even div partners or, or excuse me, defense industrial base partners, us, right, the industry. And so if you can partner with these original manufacturers, you're able to build relationships with them. When you niche down and you say, we're vendor agnostic, not, um, or excuse me, we're vendor biased. I don't like the term vendor agnostic. It's like, oh, we do everything. No, be an Amazon company or a Microsoft company or this company, that pick a winner and then roll with it. And when you do that, you begin to get a lot of experience and people trust you for knowing um, that product and how it fits in. If you think about uh, my last company, I was doing SharePoint, so I could be uh, teaming up with Microsoft or there were third party tools like AvPoint where I could team up with them. If you're in elevators uh, services and installation, Otis Elevators is somebody you can connect with. That type of idea is what I mean by OEM. And then the last one that I have here on the value of niching down is as you're growing your company and you're trying to begin to get more wins and more past performance, you can rapidly build up staff certifications around your niche, around that expertise. And so scheduling, for example, maybe it's certifications in this scheduling product and this scheduling product. Maybe there's certain ways of looking at scheduling. Maybe there's advanced project management training that relates to scheduling as an example, right? I'm just using those for examples in here, but when you niche down, it allows you not just to be able to say, hey, here's what we do and make it easy for people to understand, but it also makes it easy for you to run the back office side of your company. Okay, so let's go to 10 steps. By the way, do me a favor, if this is making sense to you right now, what I'm talking about is uh, the niche and the riches are in the niches, just put in niche down, N-I-C-H-E, right? Niche down in the chat let me know you're understanding what i'm saying about the how vital it is to niche down and not get caught up by uh, fear of missing out or fomo okay so here are 10 steps i want to share with you on how to reach that first hundred thousand right and some of you are more experienced than others uh, but these steps are the exact steps i would even pay attention to if i started a company tomorrow i would come back i wouldn't try to use my memory i'd use this checklist and say what am i doing um so uh the the first five are, are kind of preparatory stuff, preparing yourself and your company. The second five are about outreach. That's how I grouped them here. So the first thing is, I, I just wanna clarify this, get a company domain, and, and most of us have it, but some of us are on uh, Gmail, for example. Get off of that. You need to be on you know, neil.com or whatever, abccompany.com. Uh, so that way your company domain, www.abc.com, right? 
or your email, it says Neil McDonald at abccompany.com, right? That shows a level of maturity. When you're on Gmail, it shows a level of company organizational immaturity. And I've seen people who come out of the army with 25 years of experience leading hundreds and thousands of soldiers or something who get a Gmail account. And so they instantly go from being seen as really high to being seen as immature. It's not you, the individuals being seen as immature. It's the company maturity where everybody evaluates your company. And this is one way we evaluate it is that email. Okay. Number two, go into DSBS and Sam and complete your small business profile. Make sure this profile is attractive to your niche. If you did what I said and niched down, you have a core competency like scheduling your elevators or something like that, right? If you have a solid core competency, go use up all the fields within DSBS in particular and make sure the SAM data is good for your company. Just make sure you look good in there. I have an entire set of training, many, many, many trainings. I think uh, 50 plus, maybe even 100 plus trainings on DSBS and your SAM profile. It is the number one market research tool used by the federal government. Even larges use it sometimes to come in and find small businesses to, to evaluate, to work with them. So make sure your profile is saying, hey, here's what we do. Uh, so that's the second one. Number three, make sure you have a six second capability statement. Your capability statement, especially if you're trying to make your first 100,000, it's not like it's gonna be crowded. It should be only one page front and it should be read and completely understood in six seconds or less. The whole idea is I should be able to look at it and go, I got it, I know what you do, where you do it. I don't, I'm an experienced person. I can instantly see stuff. We have a whole training on that, many, many trainings on how do you, and, and all these trainings that I'm saying are free out there, right? Um, a lot of training on how do you create this statement. But the reason it's important is because if, if you hand it to somebody, the capability statement's job is to get you a meeting. It's not to inform anybody. And so you want it to quickly make them be able to go, oh, yes, let's meet. Or, oh, no, I don't want to meet with you. Those are okay. Number four, right? Make sure you have a basic website. It doesn't even need to be multiple pages. It can be one page with sections, but just make sure it kind of mimics what your capability statement and your DSBS profile say about, hey, here's what we do. And here's a little bit of our differentiator, why you should work with us. And again, if you're brand new, don't go crazy on this. Don't try to write a ton of stuff. We can all look in and know that you're not that experienced. And so now we're looking at the individual more than the company, but just have that basic website. Um, number five, go to LinkedIn. This is where all professionals in the GovCon space do social media. We don't do it on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else. And so on LinkedIn, make sure you have a personal profile and make sure it looks good. We describe it as findable and attractive. Findable are the keywords are woven into your LinkedIn profile that you want to be found for. So if you want to be found for project management, put in project management and scheduling and you know earn value management, whatever it is, weave those into your narratives that are in your profile. And that makes you both findable and attractive because if somebody is looking for a company that does project management or you're reaching out to set up a meeting, they're going to come back and look at you on LinkedIn. And attractive means does your LinkedIn profile say you do project management and scheduling, things like that. You know, the content you share, does it scream you're a subject matter expert in that space or your company is? All right. So six through 10 is about going out there and doing outreach. And I'm just tracking my time, getting really tight here. Um, first thing I want you to do when you're planning outreach, you've done the prep, uh, is determine where you fit as a sub. So you want to reach out to subcontract under small businesses. If you do scheduling, who do you want to be reaching out to, right? Well, I want to reach out to maybe program project management firms and say, hey, we, we're really great at scheduling, right? So understand um, which NAICS codes your niche fits under, and then also understand the keywords. What type of projects might somebody else have won that you can come in and support? The second thing is once you've determined that, go find 200 small businesses on FPDS who have won contracts in the last two years, right? It's, you know, I've got training out there, a little bit of training on that. You can also watch training on uh, FPDS, but it's fairly straightforward once you learn the tool. I get, I get the tools, it takes a minute to learn, but when you learn it, you can find 200 small businesses that have won and you go to DSBS, just like I told you to clean up a minute ago. And in DSBS, you get the generally the owner's name, number and email. It couldn't be better than that. Um, number eight, reach out to 25 companies every single day. Should take an hour, maybe two at the most, but you can reach all 200 companies. Uh, it shouldn't be 220. It should be 200 companies in two weeks, right? If you're doing 25 a day, that's 125. So you can hit it in two weeks. That's awesome. Um, number nine, make sure you're using process and tools, right? I suggest scripts, templates, call plans. We have training on all these things. You know, you find them on my YouTube channel and on LinkedIn, et cetera but use these tools. Don't just wing it. 
have a process that I'm kind of teaching you and then make sure you have tools to go at it. And then those 200 people you called on day three, start calling the people you called on day one, uh, you know, slow follow up. You can watch training that I talk about. How do you follow up persistently without being a pest? Right. But you want to make sure you keep following up. You don't call them once. You call them 20 times over the course of a matter of months. You will reach the companies who say, yeah, we want to use your service in here. And we've got a FTE position that's worth $100,000. Right. Um, here's what I want you to remember from today's training. The first thing is focus on only subcontracting with small businesses. If you're trying to make your first 100,000 or even your first 500,000. Right. Don't look at agencies and don't look at large primes. Don't spend a lot of time going to agency events, et cetera. The money is with the small businesses and subcontracting under them. So spend most of your time at 90% trying to build relationships with these small businesses that have succeeded that are like two and 5 million and beyond because there's room for you way more room there than there is on the priming and the large. The second thing is make sure you have that clear niche. Hopefully you put it into the chat. Um, and then the last one is just remember success is going to come when you follow a process, whatever that is, right? Whatever you do, you know this, that if you follow a particular process, you're gonna have success. And along the way, that each process step is basically a skill that you just have to continue to learn and then begin to get experience at. But when you do that, you're gonna have success.